Hello and welcome to the Point of Care podcast. Today's topic is on inpatient diuresis. For your first steps, when you're admitting a patient, you need to communicate clearly with the emergency department staff. Get strict eyes and nose from the start. You might not have the best record of how much urine the patient put out after their first dose of diuretic. If they were already diuresed, you should be figuring out whether the patient responded to that dose. You might need to ask the patient directly, as some of the staff might not know, especially if they've been signed out. You should be dosing at least two times the patient's home dose of loop diuretics. You might need a higher dose if the patient has CKD. You should keep the patient on spironolactone if that's their home medicine and they've been taking it regularly. This can help prevent hypokalemia when you're diuresing aggressively. You should also be thinking about whether or not you need a Foley or a condom catheter for male patients. This will be in the case where the patient is altered or has poor mobility and not able to get up and use the bathroom or for whatever reason, isn't able to use a urinal. For following up after diuresis, you should assess the response within one hour. If it's an adequate dose, the patient will pee immediately and they will feel it. If they're not peeing, make sure you aren't missing a low urine output from a shock state or obstruction. Nope, make sure you check when they actually got the dose, not when you ordered it, as sometimes it's delayed. If they're not responding, double the diuretic dose immediately. If they are peeing, check the total output three to four hours after they receive the dose. Ideally, this will be in the early afternoon before 3 p.m., and you should redose if not at least halfway to your goal output. Note that people say Lasix is called that because it lasts six hours, but you shouldn't actually wait six hours. For general tips, bolus in the early a.m. before rounds, and do not leave diuresis decisions to the night team if you can avoid it. For troubleshooting with diuresis, if you've reached 160 milligrams of IV Lasix BID and the patient is not responding, you should be thinking about resistance. You can switch to a drip, a different loop diuretic like torsamide or bumetanide, or augment with a thiazide diuretic such as metolazone or chlorthalidone, which works on the distal tubules. For drips, start at 10 mg per hour after bolusing to keep above the threshold. Noting that 40 milligrams of PO Lasix is equivalent to 10 to 20 PO of torsamide and one milligram of Bumex. The classic teaching is that Bumex has better oral availability. Classic teaching also says to give thiazides 30 minutes before loops. This is because thiazides are PO and loops in the inpatient setting are usually still given IV. PO medicines take longer to work. That's why you need to give it 30 minutes beforehand. If both of the medicines are PO, you can give them at the same time. Just make sure you're being explicit with the nursing staff about the ideal timing, since a thiazide may take longer to come up from the pharmacy. You don't want to delay any diuresis decisions just for a medicine to come up. Other considerations is that if the patient is alkalotic, you can add acetazolamide, especially if the K is over 4, since these medicines can lead to potassium wasting. Recent data in a trial suggests that augmentation with acetazolamide leads to euvolemia quicker though this is a recent trial and it's not clear how this is going to impact day-to-day practice. You should be monitoring the BMP daily and sometimes twice daily to be looking at the potassium, magnesium, bicarb, and creatinine. Hypokalemia is often the limiting factor for aggressive diuresis, so you should be repleting aggressively. You should also be watching out for symptoms of gout, as loop diuretics can lead to hyperuricemia. To discuss AKI and diuresis, Many patients with overload will have an AKI from pre-renal physiology or congestion. When diuresing, it takes time to mobilize third space fluid. Effective circulating volume may go down, leading to a lower GFR and increasing creatinine. This most commonly reflects hemodynamics and is not actual renal damage. The goal is to go for euvolemia, so trust your physical exam. At the same time, stay humble If there's a significant AKI and the exam is challenging, you should be cautious. For your exam and volume assessment, on a daily basis, you should be checking the patient's JVP. The JVP is a surrogate for right atrial pressures. The best way to do this is to have the patient sit at a 30 to 45 degree angle, looking at the right side of their neck for the double bounce. You should be reporting the JVP as normal, high, or low. Normal is six to eight centimeters of water. If you see it at a 90 degree angle, it's high. 
Note that the JVP can also be high in pulmonary hypertension, tamponade, and RV failure. You can also do hepatojugular reflux. A positive finding is if the JVP stays elevated for 10 or more seconds after you compress the liver. Importantly, everybody's JVP should go up if you push on their liver. It's just a matter of how long does it stay elevated. For low extremity edema, you should push and hold. The grade of the pitting is based on the depth of the depression and the time to rebound. In general, it's three plus if it takes 60 seconds or more for it to rebound, and it's four plus if it takes two to three minutes. You can also note crackles, though note that they're not specific for overload or acute decompensated heart failure. You can ask about symptoms including paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea and shortness of breath, and this should be improving with diuresis. You can do a POCUS. For your volume exam, the IVC diameter greater than 2 centimeters, or if it collapses less than 50% with respiration, suggests an overloaded state. Pulmonary edema can also be seen with 3 plus B lines in 2 plus lung zones. For switching to PO in discharging patients, you switch them to PO when their symptoms resolve and their JVP and edema is improved. There's a sweet spot of euvolemia, which is an increase in bicarb suggesting a contraction alkalosis, but no creatinine bump to suggest that the patient is too dry. This isn't terribly reliable. Also, dry weight is unreliable and is not the overall goal. Ideally, you would trial PO dose of diuretic for 24 hours and shoot for a net negative of 500 cc's because we expect the patient to eat more salt and potentially drink more fluid at home. Your chosen PO dose should be based on the etiology of the decompensation. If the patient wasn't taking their home medicine reliably, you can just send them home with the same dose. If you're concerned about possible resistance as the etiology of decompensation, you should go up on the dose. For guidance, ask the patient to take their weight daily. Also to ask them to pay attention to their low extremity edema. If it's worse, or the patient gains 5 pounds over a 3-4 to four day period or 2-3 to three pounds over a 24-48 to 48 hour period, Ask them to double their diuretic dose and call their PCP or cardiologist for further guidance. When presenting patients on a daily basis who are being diuresed, follow this template. Say, over the last 24 hours, the patient has put out blank CCs, was net negative blank, after being treated with blank, suggesting that the patient is or is not sensitive at this dose. Since the admission, they're net negative a total of blank CCs and have lost blank pounds. My exam this morning showed JVP, edema, suggesting that the patient is either still overloaded, euvolemic, or dry. Today, I'd like to diurese with IV, whatever you want, with a goal of net negative, at least two liters for HEFREF, or about one to two liters for HEFPEF. We'll assess this output by this specific time and redose or go to either a higher dose, a thiazide, or a drip as needed. If you remember nothing else, in acute decompensated heart failure in overloaded states, provided the patient's heart function is at baseline and they're not in shock, the mainstay of treatment is aggressive diuresis. You should bolus early in the morning and check response within one hour to see if the patient responded and redose by the early afternoon if they're not at goal. Diuresis based on symptoms and your volume exam, not based on weight alone. Continue diuresing through mild elevations in creatinine as it rarely indicates an intrinsic AKI. If they're not responding to higher doses of loop diuretics, switch to a drip or augment with thiazides. Replenish K and magnesium to not fall behind with your diuresis. Instruct patients to call their PCP or cardiologist if they notice worsening lower extremity edema or gain three to five pounds over a three to four day period. That's all for this episode. Check out pointofcaremedicine.com to see the templates we discussed as well as the pearls, literature, and links to other resources.